not here at Alabama. We talked to Nick Saban yesterday, and you could just tell a little bitter taste in his mouth about the way they finished up a year ago. What was his message to his club during their 15 spring practices, and what is he trying to get out of his group? Absolutely. Coming into spring, the number one thing for Coach Saban is get his team back to thinking the way they did when they were successful. Get that focus back. Get that intensity back. Get that attention to detail back. He said the last six years of success finally caught up with him last year, and he realized it very early, tried to fix it here this spring and get his team back to where they were in seasons past. Obviously, one of the big storylines around here, the quarterback position. We'll talk about that as the afternoon unfold but let's head down to the field join the third member of our team her name is Allison Williams has more on this Bama spring game hey Allison hey there Dave fans in Tuscaloosa anxious to see what this Alabama offense will look like under new offensive coordinator Lane Kiffin but they really shouldn't expect it to be that different first of all it's the spring game so you know they're going to keep it pretty vanilla but Kiffin said it wouldn't be smart to go changing the offense with all the returning skill players he said he the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So Alabama will continue to be pro style. But really, guys, we won't know what this offense is going to look like until we know who the quarterback is going to be. Absolutely. And the guy that's going to get the football first will be Blake Sims for this Alabama team. He's, he finishes spring practice in the number one slot. Nick Saban with the underhand toss to the return, man. And it is a touch game on the kickoff special teams will not be your normal special teams in the spree game as you look at uh, the rules of the Alabama a day game normal scoring as you might expect black jersey players you'll see all the quarterbacks in black and a couple of other players wearing black and that means that they're not available for contact but they will be out on the field running clock except on scores penalties change possessions in the last four minutes of each half so these games move along rather quickly so Blake Sims will have the football first, the six foot, 200 pound senior out of Gainesville. TJ Yeldon is your starting running back. First handoff will go to Yeldon off the right side. Now, TJ, big gainer over the 40 as he picks up a dozen yards on the opening carry. So, Joey Blake Sims wins an open competition in the spring and is clearly the number one quarterback. Uh, your impressions of Blake? Very athletic. I watched him in practice on Thursday. The problem is standing in the pocket. You mentioned he's six feet tall. You look at Alabama's offensive line. A lot of these guys are 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 6 6. When Sim stands in the pocket, he has trouble seeing over his lineman, has to find lanes to get the ball out of his hands. And Sims will be touched in the backfield. That'll go down as a sack. Davier Dixon, the senior out of Griffin, Georgia, making the big play for this Alabama defense. And certainly the Alabama defense, an area that uh, Coach Saban really wanted to see kind of I don't necessarily say tough enough, but improve in some areas and the pass rush one of those. Yeah, I believe so. And, and you look at number 90 there, Jaron Reed gets to the quarterback. He's a junior college guy, only been here about 15 practices through the spring, and has already shown these coaches enough to get in the, and get out there and get some playing time. And you can see his ability there getting to the quarterback. So on second down, we'll delay handoff. And yelled it. Chopped down at the 35, gain of a couple on the play. Well, you want to talk about a stable of running backs? I would be hard-pressed to find another team in the country that has as much talent in the backfield to carry the football as this Alabama group. Yeah, if you want to talk about a place that, that Coach Kiffin can hang his hat, I mean, look at these running backs. When you get past Yeldon, you got Kenyon Drake, and then Derrick Henry. Henry's a guy, he's a bigger kid. You watch him run, you watch him in practice. He looks like an Eddie George type of running back. Maybe not as thick, maybe not as physical, but boy, is he a specimen. Christian Jones comes across the formation in motion, but they will hand it off to the left side and yelled it again. He's wrapped up. It'll be the first team offense against the first team defense here on the opening possession. As you look at T.J. Yeldon, who is part of that group that uh, has rushed for over 2,300 career yards, 1,200 last year at 14 touchdowns. But Derrick Henry was the guy that came on late last year that kind of got the uh, Alabama fans certainly excited about the potential for that young man. And Kenyon Drake is an explosive playmaker that's kind of been lost in the shuffle a little bit. Yeah, and that's what Coach Kiffin told us. He's their home run hitter. He's the guy that when they put it in his hands, anywhere on the field, he has the ability to put it in the end zone. He can go the distance. He's that kind of running back. Five-yard punt from Alec Morris, who happens to be a backup quarterback. 
Chris Black back to return that punt, and the white team will have the football for the first time inside the 30 down to 20. Actually, they'll spot it back at the 20-yard line. So on the opening possession, the uh, white defense held up against the Crimson offense. As you look at Cooper Bateman, the redshirt freshman from Utah. Inside Bryant Denny Stadium here in Tuscaloosa. It's the annual A Day game. Dave Neal, Joey Galloway, Allison Williams down on the sidelines. Here goes Cooper Bateman off the right side. The redshirt freshman quarterback. As we have had one possession in the game, and the number one offense was stuffed by the number one Crimson defense on the first possession, forcing a punt as Nick Saban looks on as he always does in his coat and tie on the A-Day game. So just uh, our second possession here, and it's the white offense, the number two offense, with the football. Tyron Jones, number 20, a redshirt freshman out of Marietta, Georgia, in the backfield. And Jones gets the carry off the left side, and he'll pick up a couple of yards over the 25 to the 26. Jonathan Allen led the charge defensively. There's Cooper Bateman, 6'3", freshman uh, out of Murray, Utah. Cooper Bateman's a, Bateman is a guy that Coach Saban said his good plays are very good and his bad plays are very bad. And they're trying to get him to be more consistent, be in the middle somewhere of those plays. And if they can do that, he has a chance to play some football. Boy, one word that kept popping out in our conversations with the coaches yesterday, consistency. That's what they want from that quarterback position. They want to know what they're going to get every single snap. Bateman drops back in the pocket. Underneath pass is caught by Robert Foster. That'll be a gain of nine, and that'll move the chains. You talk about that consistency from the quarterback situation. Think about A.J. McCarron, how consistent he was, what kind of leader he was. All of a sudden, he's gone, and then these young quarterbacks who haven't played much football have to try to step in and lead the team that same way with that consistency. And if they can get consistency from the quarterback position, they have so much talent around him in the skill positions that they'll be successful. So Bateman will be in the shotgun again, and Jones lines up to his right. Bateman will throw again. Over the middle pass is caught, they'll say, out near the 50-yard line. Parker Barino with the catch, a gain of 17. Parker, the junior, out of Northport, Alabama, just down the road. How about Bateman standing in the pocket here? Had a couple guys open short, decides to hold on to the ball, reads his linebackers, creeping up, goes over their head and delivers a strike over the middle. A couple of catches last year for Parker. Trying maybe a little flea flicker of some sort, but a loss of five. Jones turned around, had the ball around his chest. Almost looked like he was trying to toss it out of there. Jonathan Allen with another play. And it's a good thing for the defense that he didn't get it out. They had Falcons down the middle, wide open, down the center of the field. So it was definitely a flea flicker and set up very nicely. The defensive line did a nice job of net, not allowing the running back to get the ball out. Well, that's an area that coaches talked about has been a, uh, an improvement, is that defensive front for Alabama. The additions of uh, Jaron Reed, DJ Petway on that defensive front, along with guys like A. Sean Robinson, Brandon Ivory. They have come to play here in spring practice. Over the middle pass is dropped around the 35-yard line. Let's go downstairs, check in with Allison Williams once again. Some technical difficulties with that mic. If you didn't notice, that was A.J. McCarron alongside Allison. We will try to get back down there, catch up with A.J., see if we can get that uh, mic working, see where A.J. is in terms of looking forward to the NFL draft as he wrapped up an unreal career here at Alabama. It'll be third down and 16 for the white team. Three receivers set. 
Bateman has to throw it as he is pressured again. Came from Tim Williams, the sophomore out of Baton Rouge. And that'll force a punting situation for the white team. Boy, defense, defense, defense. Coach Saban has some concerns on that side of the ball. Perhaps the biggest is in the secondary, his cornerback position, Eddie Jackson, who was expected to play a lot of snaps, one of the leaders in that area, out with a knee injury, not playing in this A-Day game. They hope to have him back by fall practice. Christian Jones grabs the football, a 40-yard punt. So we'll take our first time out here at the annual A-Day game in Tuscaloosa. Lane Kiffin, Diffin's Crimson offense back on the field when we return. The most storied conference in college athletics has a new home as ESPN brings you the SEC Network. Launching in August, a couple of months down the road, the SEC Network will feature over 1,000 exclusive live events, including 45 football games, 24-7 coverage of all 21 conference sports. Go to GetSECNetwork.com and tell your TV provider you refuse to miss out on the action. It all begins August 14th. So the Crimson offense with the football for the second time. First two drives combined, 31 yards. Derrick Henry, his first action today in the backfield, but Sims will throw it, and it is dropped. Over the middle, Chris Black, the sophomore out of Jacksonville, Florida. Well, here's a little bit of the SEC network and what you could expect in a few months. As we mentioned, 24-7. Nothing but SEC content coming your way every single moment of every single day. Studio shows, including SEC Nation, which will travel around and get you ready for college football Saturdays. Tim Tebow, a part of that. I'm sure you will see Nick Saban a time or two on the network. Just guessing. <laughs> Here's Sims on a rollout. Dumps it off underneath to Justin Fowler, the senior fullback slash H-back. For the Crimson Tide, a gain of 16 on the play. Let's go back downstairs and check in once again with Allison Williams. Hey there, guys. Uh, can you hear me now? Hope so. Here with AJ McCarron. Uh, first time as a spectator here at the spring game after your illustrious career at Alabama. What is it like to be watching from the sidelines? Uh, it's definitely weird, um, but it's fun. I mean, you get to come out and relax uh, watching my little brother play. So. Uh, I'm definitely enjoying it and, uh, you know, just kind of taking everything in. It's been a while since I've uh, been in this stadium and not had to play, so uh, I'm having fun with it. All right, you had such a career here at Alabama, part of three national championships. It didn't end the way you would want with back-to-back -back losses. And when we talked to Coach Saban, he talked about complacency with last year's team. Did you ever sense that at any point during the season last year? Well, I mean, yeah, anytime you know, you have a bunch of success. Uh, it's always room uh, for everybody to be complacent. But I felt like the captains, uh, you know, the older guys, we wanted it. Um, we weren't complacent. I think if you ask coaches, you know, any of them, uh, they'll tell you that. But uh, it, it takes a, a full team. So, um, but I mean, we were young and, and we struggled at times. So if you think about it, I, mean, I know everybody freaks out. It's two losses, one by a freakish play at the end of the game and the next one is just a bad bowl game so uh, I mean it's not that bad of a season if you ask me but uh, definitely wish we could have won more but it's football it happens. You mentioned the attitude of the captains and today you were inducted into the Walk of Fame with your fellow captains what was that like for you? Uh, I mean it's such an honor and a blessing um, to just play this game for one but uh, to be mentioned with so many uh, great guys that have played this game here and um, you know, to have our name there for the rest of our life, uh, it, it definitely means a lot to us and, uh, you know, it was a, a fun moment. All right, it's been a busy off season already for you. You got engaged last month, wedding coming up in July, preparing for the NFL draft and then joining a team. How are you juggling it all? Well, uh, the good part about it is I don't have anything to do with the wedding, so I just kind of, she does all that, plans it, and I'll just she tell me the date and I'll show up and, uh, We'll go that way, but right now I'm just focused on football, and that's that's the good thing about it is uh, 
you know, I'm close to getting back just playing football, and that's what I love to do. All right, thank you, AJ. Thank you. Guys. Thank you very much, Allison and AJ. There's his little brother, Corey McCarron, a fullback on this team. We'll step aside for a moment. The White will have the football when we come back to Alabama. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on, we can't have them negative plays, man. Come on, come on, Cam. We only got to protect them for a little bit. Let's go. Hey, guys, we got to have a middle hook guy in the middle hook. Hey, hey guys, look, we don't want to be conservative in this game. All right, but when we call pass play, we got pass protect, man. Can't get sacked every time. Let's go. We want to throw the ball and get better. A little of the message sent by Coach Saban. Appreciate him allowing us to put a microphone on during this spring game. We'll bring you some sound from the coach throughout the afternoon. So the white offense under the direction of Cooper Bateman with the football for the second time. Kenyon Drake, the junior out of Powder Springs, Georgia with the carry. He picks up eight. Well, they really like a, a lot about Kenyon. You see what he put together last year, averaged over seven yards a carry and eight touchdowns. You mentioned he's kind of their home run hitter. Yeah, you can see how quickly he hit the hole. He changed directions, got up in the hole and picked up eight yards after the handoff. And that's where the success has been so far here today in the first quarter is running the football. Not much in the pass game just yet. Drake had 99 yards against Ole Miss, 106 against Kentucky, 104 against Arkansas. It was playing a backup role. He turns the corner on the far side. Drake cuts it back. He's to the 40, and they will blow the whistle with Drake at the 35 and almost busted out of all those jerseys, and that'll get a nice round of applause after a run of 26 yards. Finally, the 80,000 woke up. Something, uh, something to get him into the game. You can see his speed and his quickness, and the ability to stop, change directions, and get fast again. There's a difference between guys that are fast and guys that are really fast football players. Guys that can run in a straight line, they're only good out wide. Guys that can take the football in their hands, have the ability to be fast in spurts, stop your feet, get fast again, those are the guys that are scary. Those are the ones that are explosive. Bateman goes under center. We'll hand it off to Drake again. Breaks a tackle, but can't break the second. A loss of one on the play. You see the crimson defense there. Uh, they, they realized that, that, that Drake was starting to get a little warm. So what they did was brought a blitz off the side, catch him in the backfield, not let him get his feet started, not let him build up his speed. Then he's hard to deal with. But if you catch him two to three yards deep, make him make a cut, get his hands on him, that's when you bring down the big play guy. Yeah, Reuben Foster, the inside linebacker. Nice play defensively. Missed him the first time, but got up and made the play moments later. Second down, and let's call it a dozen. Bateman will throw. Going toward the end zone on the far side. Pass is caught. It's Robert Foster, the redshirt freshman, stepping up with a 34-yard reception. How about the catch by Foster? Now, he made it look easy, and receivers do this at times. This is a difficult catch. They tell quarterbacks, throw the ball over the outside shoulder of the receiver. And you can tell here, he has to lean back and follow the ball with his eyes over his head. That's a difficult catch. Nice play on the sideline, gets his feet in. So it'll be first and goal from the two for the white team. Alti Tenpenny checks in at running back as Bateman will line up in the shotgun. Last year, Alabama in the red zone, 10th in the conference. Overall, scored a touchdown 64% of the time, a little bit below the numbers they would like. King Penny driving off the right side. He has stopped just shy of the goal line. Give him a yard and a half on the play. Foster again, Reuben Foster, one of those in the middle of the pack, along with Tim Williams. Boy, Reuben Foster, one of those guys that came out of high school. A year ago, so highly touted. Everybody thought he was going to go to Auburn, but the last minute changes his mind, comes here to Alabama, considered the number one inside linebacker in the country, but can't quite crack the starting lineup just yet for this Alabama defense. Boy, nothing happening there. Tim Williams with another big play. 
And these are the moments you find out about your offensive line, and that's been one of the questions here at Alabama is how well will their offensive line play. Well, that'll do it for the first quarter with the white team knocking on the door. We'll see if they can stick it in the end zone when we come back. The first quarter's in the books. Boy, a long storied history of Alabama football. They have won 15 national titles, 23 SEC titles. Bear Bryant, Nick Saban, two of the best that have ever been in coaching college football. Nick Saban won titles in 09, 11, and 12. Interesting, though, Alabama's only won two SEC titles since 1999. They won in 09 and 12. You'd think they'd won a lot more with all the national championships, but that hasn't been the case. No one would have ever guessed that. Yeah. That, that would be a terrific <laughs> trivia question, which is why you make the big bucks. You, 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 know, you just know I'll, it. You just I'll know ask, that kind of stuff. I'll ask Coach Saban that when we get finished. <laughs> $7 million man down there on the field today here at Bryant-Denny Stadium watching his troops in the annual A-Day game. Dave Neal, Joey Galloway, Allison Williams down on the sidelines. The white team trying to stick it in the end zone here. Cooper Bateman under pressure, and he will be dropped for a sack outside the 10-yard line. That'll be a loss of 10. Dalvin Tomlinson, first man back there. And once again, the O-line, as you were talking about, having a hard time holding up in the trenches. Yeah, a little do or die by the defense there. If they didn't get to Bateman, he had a couple guys open coming across the back. Tomlinson does a nice job of not allowing Bateman to see the receivers coming open in the back of the end zone. So Adam Griffith will attempt the field goal from 31 yards away near hash mark. And the kick is no good. It has been an, an issue with Coach Saban. He says when we get guys lined up to kick field goals, I usually stand a few yards away and they don't kick it so well. And they turn around, look at me and say, they're making me, you're making me nervous, Coach. And he tells them, well, guys, guess what? During a game, I'm going to be on the field. I'm well, going to be here during the game. You well, might as well get used to it. I watched the field goal kicking in practice on Thursday, and I, I tell you what, it was scary. Yeah. It, it was scary and, and became comical at, at one point uh, where the ball was lined. That is, a, that is an area that they're going to have to improve. We've seen the backup quarterback punt a football here today, and then we've seen a missed field goal. The, the kicking game, there's going to be a lot of work to meet, need to be done by the time these guys open up with West Virginia. No Cody Mandel, he averaged 47 yards a punt. No Cade Foster, he had 12 of 17 field goals, 60 of 60. And point afters. So the Crimson team will have the football at the 20-yard line. Blake Sims, your quarterback. He will hand it off to Yeldon. Breaks a tackle down the far sideline, still on his feet. Across midfield to the 45 yard line give him a, a gain of 36 on the play. Nice little sweep here and you can see the pulling the pulling tackle out in front. Ryan Kelly does a really nice job of getting out in front and, and you can see Yeldon he's tough to bring down. He's a thick kid and you see him his lower body's as thick as anybody which is why he's so tough to bring down has terrific balance. Four carries, 50 yards today for T.J. Yeldon. Averaging six yards a carry in his Alabama career. Sims throws. Hits the tight end. Brian Vogler out of Columbus, Georgia, a senior. Oh, well, we have an SEC college softball doubleheader later today on ESPNU. First and four, the LSU Tigers take on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Then at six, it's the Gators as they travel to College Station to face Texas A&M. It's an SEC college softball doubleheader today at four and six on ESPNU. Both games are also live on Watch ESPN. Second down. After the incomplete pass to Vogler, and off to the right side. I'll get three, maybe three and a half. So Blake Sims wins the battle, and the question is, what does he 
what does he think about the future as Jacob Coker, the transfer from Florida State, will be making his way to the capstone when he graduates from Florida State at the end of May. Yeah, in some situation, winning the spring battle only gets you to the next, right. <laughs> it's the next spot of now you go back to competing again. You run one battle, you got to go back and try to do it again. Throws like that again, that's a situation where Sims is in the pocket and a misread between either Sims or the receiver. Most people like to blame the receiver. Um, I always like to blame the quarterback. Absolutely, in, in, I'm sure. In those Absolutely. misread situations, <laughs> right. but definitely a miscommunication and a ball that should have been picked off. You know, I work with Andre Ware a lot, and he always seems to blame the receiver. Yeah, and that's you're the problem. here and he, yeah. you're blaming the quarterback. You know what? And, and most and most broadcasters are quarterbacks. <laughs> right. So you He's always <laughs> hear the, the receiver ran the wrong route. It's not, not always the receiver. A lot of times quarterbacks just read things incorrectly. So Sim struggling today throwing the football just one out of five for 16 yards. And that punt will hit it to 25, and that's where it'll be down. We'll step aside for a moment. When we come back, we will visit with the man, all fine bombs. Stay with us. Gorgeous day here at the Capstone, Bryant Denny Stadium, scoreless here in the annual Alabama spring game as we're in the second quarter up in our broadcast position. We are joined by a guy that uh, you will hopefully see quite a bit on the new SEC network coming up on August 15th. It's the debut of the Paul Feinbaum show on the SEC network. It's been a show for a long time on the radio dial, but we're taking it to TV now as Paul has become a uh, big part of the SEC and ESPN networks. He joins us now, Joey Galloway on the far side. And uh, Paul, thanks for joining us. I know it's an exciting time. You've taken a show that really kind of blossomed here in the state of Alabama, and it has gone coast to coast now. Can you believe where this has gone in a short amount of time? Well, I think it's gone that way, not because of anything I've done, but because of the passion of the people in this stadium down at Auburn today. And if we were on right now doing a simulcast, the Alabama fans would be pretty unhappy. <laughs> right. They would be angry. They would be following Joey's uh, admonition of the quarterback situation and the special team situation. Well, as far as this Alabama uh, team is concerned, Paul, obviously there are some questions. The quarterback spot, obviously number one on there. Can the defense improve some certain areas? What has been your take on where this Alabama team needs to go to get back to that championship level? Well, I think that decision was made around the time of the BCS championship game when Lane Kiffin was brought in. He has uh, given it a spark. I saw him down on the field, and it was still kind of weird to see Lane Kiffin yes. and Nick Saban on the same sidelines because uh, they had an infamous game here a couple of years ago. But th this offense sputtered a little bit, and I say that, uh, as you both know, and that's, that's what they need more of, too, is the fact that, that Alabama was really one, one incredible play away from perhaps being in a position to play for the national championship. But at Alabama, it's perfection. Uh, these fans don't really believe anything short of a national championship is part of their birthright. Paul, we had, we've sort of had a quarterback competition. I say sort of because the, the guy that everyone has crowned as a starter isn't here yet, so the winner of the spring gets a chance to then compete with Coker, who's coming in sometime this summer. How do you foresee the quarterback situation playing out here? Yeah, with, with all due respect to, to Sims and Bateman and everyone else, I mean, they win the right today to lose to Jacob Coker in a couple of months. Well, as far as, as, as Coker goes, what we know, we don't know a lot. I mean, he hasn't played a lot. But what is the perception that, that makes us believe or buy into the fact that he's a guy that can be anointed the next guy? But because he's not here. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, interestingly, I talked to his coach from uh, Mobile last night, and, and he talked about uh, he, he also tutored uh, A.J. McCarron. And, and, and he reminded me, and you guys already know this, that, that Jacob Coker, fought hard and almost won the starting job amazingly at FSU against James is that, Winston. Is that, is that true? I mean, he I, said it was. You now, hear that. In, and I can't give opinion, us some truth serum. If, if it's true, <laughs> then they had to have the best two quarterbacks in the country on, on one team. So it's a difficult well, story to accept. Yeah, we could go back to Cam Newton and <laughs> Tim Tebow. But yeah, listen, <laughs> right. I, Joey, you're, you're, you, you, you broke the code. I think yeah. it's a great okay. story. The coaches say, I wasn't there. Um, I don't know how he could have beat out Jameis Winston, but I think it gives fuel to the Alabama fans. I believe he's good. 
uh, based on the people I've talked to, based on what Lane Kiffin has had to say, at least in anticipation. anticipation. Um, and Alabama needs a good quarterback because they had a, a, a long run under A.J. McCarron, which nearly uh, broke the history books. Let's talk about big picture. And I know Alabama fans uh, don't really care about the Auburn spring game. It's going on and down the road. But nonetheless, is Auburn in your eyes, from what you can tell about the way Gus Malzahn has that program and the direction it's headed, can they sustain the level they played at a year ago? I think they can, but I'm not sure they can do it this year. Uh, they have a couple of things working against them, uh, mainly the schedule. Uh, it's, a, it's a little more difficult. And can you, I, I don't want to say it's luck, although I, I will say the Georgia game was luck. Uh, I mean, the Alabama run back w had some coaching that went into that. And, of course, Nick Saban take, putting the, the one second back on the clock at the end of the Auburn game will live in infamy. But, but I, I think Auburn will be, be very good this year. I don't think they will win the SEC, though. Paul Peyton Manning created a little bit of uh, uproar. I know you're a Tennessee guy. Uh, what were your feelings towards <laughs> Saban and uh, Peyton Manning getting together for a meeting? Joy, I asked Coach Saban that on the field today, and I, I can't use the word that he said. He said, <laughs> how do I always end up in the middle of this blank? Right. Um, <laughs> and, and it seems like that's what's going on right now. He, you know, the 10 second rule, the end of the, uh, the season against Oklahoma. I think it's much ado about nothing. I mean, he said they were here two weeks ago. It, the story that came out this week acted like they were here yesterday. And it, he reiterated that he didn't talk to the two together. He talked to them individually. Now, listen, do you believe it? Like, like you believe the Winston story? I don't know. I mean, Nick Saban wouldn't mislead any of us, of course. But uh, <laughs> other than the Miami Dolphins fans. But, but the point is, I, I think it's a ridiculous story. Well, let's talk about another subject real quickly. And that is, uh, you've got a new book coming out. When is that? First of all, when's it coming out? What's it about? And give us a little brief synopsis. Well, no coincidence it will come out uh, the same week as the SEC Network is Shocking. launched. Uh, Shocking. The, the, <laughs> name, the name of the book is My Conference Can Beat Your Conference, uh, Why the SEC Still Rules College Football. And it's going to be about how this run began. It's going to, it's going to be about the fan culture, how the, our show intersects with that. And and uh, I will be outside the stadium selling advanced copies here in five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll buy one. <laughs> Let me ask, uh, let's go spin this back around to your radio show, which has certainly taken on a life of its own. When you go to the TV side, uh, I'm sure the anticipation is to s sustain what you have, what you have created there. Um, will that be a difficult thing to do with now that TV is in the mix? Well, I mean, you, you obviously both know what I look like, so that's the first <laughs> challenge. May makeup and a toupee will not help this. Um, but I, I think... We are going to obviously broaden what we've been doing uh, because there are 14 schools in the SEC and, and we want to cater to all of them. But I think what we're going to represent and create is the fan culture that we did here in Alabama and extend it. And uh, SEC fans go from coast to coast. And I, th I think, well, at least I hope it will work. Well, certainly we are looking forward to I think all of us are looking forward to the launch of the network coming up in August 14th, 24-7 uh, SEC channel. And Paul Feinbaum, a big, big part of that. And, Paul, uh, great seeing you. Great spending time with you. Have a uh, good rest of the weekend. Thank you. My pleasure, guys. Thank you. Paul Feinbaum, as we continue on with the Alabama spring game, the A-Day game. There's a look at the SEC banner. That's what it's going to look like coming up in just a couple of months. Six oh five to go here in the second quarter. Still waiting on somebody to strike. The white team had a chance in the red zone down at the one yard line, but ended up losing five yards on a run play and then got a sack and missed a field goal. Pass over the middle incomplete. Sims can't get it untracked through the air so far. He is now two out of seven for 26 yards and a, looking for Chris Black. Landon Collins back there making another play. We haven't talked a whole lot about the safety spot. The coaches talking to uh, Kirby Smart, really happy with the safety play. Once again, it's his corners that he's having some issues with. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you if you look at the guys that left, Sanceri's gone, Clinton Dick's gone, you'd have thought that safety would have been an area of concern, but you talk to Kirby Smart, you know, Landon Collins is a guy that's played a lot of football, they think he'll be the next really good safety here at Alabama. But Geno Smith has been the story of the spring. He, he's been outstanding so far, and he's a guy that's been a big surprise. So time out on the field, 5.08 to go in the second quarter. Back in a moment to Tuscaloosa. Very okay in the studio at halftime. Charles Armuckle going to join me. We'll run through what Alabama has back on offense. Despite what we've seen so far, yes, they do have some talent on offense also. 
uh, how they bounce back. History says they will this year after the back to back losses, and we'll check in on those Auburn Tigers, guys. All right, thank you, Dar. Good to see you or listen to you on a beautiful day here in Tuscaloosa. That man has been mic'd up today. Let's listen to Coach Saban. Come on, let's go. Get out of the huddle. Let's go. Hey, Tim. You got to go, man. You got to go. You got to flat step and cue in their hearts. When, when you come down in one invert, it's the same thing that happened in practice the other day. You got to look through the tight end and see the triangle. The tight end blocks. If he goes in there, somebody will cut you. You got run support. So I got to come out and fly. Or you just play like cover three. All right? Coach Saban talking to. Hootie Jones, the early enrollee, the true freshman out of Monroe, Louisiana, a guy they're really high on. And six true freshmen have enrolled early in January. Almost an outstanding catch by Robert Foster, but it falls incomplete. Let's go down the sidelines. Allison Williams has found another former outstanding Bama player. Yes, here with offensive lineman Barrett Jones, now with the St. Louis Rams. And we just heard a little bit from Coach Saban during this spring game. Give us some insight. What was it like playing for Coach Saban? Well, I love playing for Coach. You know, he is a, an excellent football coach, but he's also uh, teaches you a lot about life. And I really just uh, love coming back here, visiting with him, talking to him, because uh, he just has so much wisdom. And, you know, he made me better in so many ways. And so that's why I really love playing for him. The offensive line at Alabama is traditionally the backbone of the offense, one of the strongest parts of the offense. This year, some question marks there. What's been your assessment of the O-line? Absolutely. Well, you know, we've had a kind of built a culture here of great offensive line play, and it's something that we take great pride in. And I think we have some good leadership in, in, in place like Austin Shepard and uh, Ryan Kelly and some of those guys who have some experience. But we do have some, some younger guys coming in. I've been really interested today to watch Cam Robinson, the left tackle, and uh, to see how he's, he's doing. Also, Liam Brown. Brown at right guard and so there's some big spots to fill uh, but I think we have the personnel to do it and I have uh, all the faith that coach Saban will get the right guys in the right spot. What advice would you give to a guy like Cam Robinson coming in as a freshman and contending for that starting tackle position? You know, I would just tell them to, to work hard, not get frustrated, and, and spend lots of time in the playbook, you know, because that's the most challenging thing is when you make that jump from high school to college, uh, football becomes so much bigger, and, and there's so many more uh, complexities to the game that you really never knew existed. And so I'm sure that's what he's going through right now. And the key is he's got the talent. He's just got to learn the playbook well enough uh, that he can play with confidence, you know, and that's what I'm starting to see today is that he's playing confident, he's playing well, and I think he's going to be a great player. All right, Barrett, thank you so much for the time. Enjoy the rest of the spring game. Thanks so much. Guys. Well, there's a uh, classic example of a true student athlete right there in Barrett Jones. Certainly one of the best that ever played the position of center here at Alabama. So far in this game, Joey, it has been all about defense. Offense has really been stuck in the mud. Yeah, it has, and there has not been a lot in the passing game. And I think that was the biggest question coming in. Everyone to see how the quarterbacks were going to perform, looking at Blake Sims, looking at Cooper Bateman. Neither passing game on either side has been able to get on a roll and, and sustain anything. All the big plays have come in the running game, and everyone knew that Alabama could run the football. They knew what kind of running backs they've had. So we've seen big plays there still. Everyone's sort of waiting. Let's open up this passing game and see what we have. Well, the first eight drives of this game, we have seen seven punts and one missed field goal. Jonathan Allen has been solid defensively. A couple of pressures, four tackles, two behind the line, and a sack. Blake Sims, numbers aren't so good. Two of seven, 26 yards. He's back on the field, leading the number one offense, the Crimson unit. He will step back and fire over the middle. Pass is high, but caught. Nice grab by Amari Cooper. And coaches told us we'll see one, two, maybe three. Super plays from Amari, and that's number one. And you can see the arm by Sims. You can see it when it comes out of his hand, it jumps out of his hand. This is a nice ball thrown in the seam. Nice timing on this ball. Has to squeeze it in there, throws it a little high to get it over the linebackers. Low enough for Cooper to go up, snatch it before he gets to the safeties. But that's a throw. That's that athleticism. That's that arm. That's the ability that Sims flashes. Now he just has to be more consistent, which we talked about earlier, and have the ability to find lanes to get the ball out of his hands. Derrick Henry with a gain of six. Brad DeSilve with the stop. Derrick Henry left high school as the all-time leading rusher in high school football history. 
12,124 yards. Set up the screen to Henry, and he has met and stopped right in his tracks by Reggie Raglan, the linebacker. That'll be a loss of two on the play. Nice job by Raglan getting around Kuanjo, the left guard, who was out there to block. But it's a tough situation for an offensive lineman to block out in space, and these linebackers, especially athletic like Raglan, can get around them and make a stop. Incomplete. Now the clock is a running clock until we get to the last four minutes of each half, and that is where we are now with 2.35 on the clock. Fourth down, looks like this Crimson team will go for it as they are at the 34-yard line. That last play, Dave, that's a situation where Sims, you'd like to see him maybe use his athleticism, tuck that ball away, and see if you can find a way to get a first down. You're out on the edge, out where you're good. Sometimes these athletic quarterbacks, because they get caught up in the talk of, can I be a pocket passer? Can I throw the ball downfield? At times, when it's time to make a play, get out wide, and let your athleticism take over and move the chains. Over the middle. Sims got rid of it early. His pressure was coming. It's incomplete on fourth down, and the white team will have the football. Well, the SEC Network kicks off the college football season on Thursday, August 28th. Coverage begins with Tim Tebow and SEC Nation live from williams Bryce Stadium in Columbia. Then the Gamecocks open the season at home against Texas A&M, followed by Temple and Vanderbilt from Nashville. Go to GetSECNetwork.com and tell your TV provider you refuse. You absolutely refuse to miss out on the action. Way to kick off the network. South Carolina, Texas AM. Boy, I think the Gamecocks are going to be good. Little screen set up to Kenyon Drake. Drake trying to break some tackles, does so, and scoots out to the 40 yard line. Give him six. Uber Bateman. For now, five out of eight, 60. Make that 72 yards, no picks, no touchdowns. Offs it up, trying to get Robert Foster to make a play, goes incomplete. And again, it looks like a miscommunication between Bateman and Foster. Not quite sure who's at fault on that one. Bateman gets stuck in a situation where he throws up, Foster goes up, plays a little defense and smacks that ball down. These are the situations where you get to the end of the half and you got a two-minute situation. These are the times when A.J. McCarron makes a coach feel comfortable. You know you got a veteran guy in there to take your team that understands the situation in these moments. These young quarterbacks, this is a perfect time in the spring to work these two-minute situations. That's when you have more control of the offense. That's when things are moving so fast. You don't have time to think sometimes. You just have to make plays. These are great experiences for guys that haven't played much football. That pass is caught at the 43, about a yard shy of the first down. Robert Foster. He has become the favorite target of Bateman here in the first half of this A-Day game. One forty-three and counting to go before halftime. Tom Ritter, our referee, talking to Nick Saban right now. And coach wanted to get a timeout time out for the white team. This is definitely a, a spring football call here. A uh, fourth down on your own side of the 50-yard line. Close game. Uh, I think that during the season, you punt this ball away for sure. I think spring football, when, when you said Coach Saban called a, uh, called a timeout, I wasn't sure which team he's calling timeout for because, <laughs> you know, defensively you'd like to call a timeout in that situation and, and try to get a stop here. Well, fourth and short. They Give the football to Drake, and he has stopped. Reuben Foster was the first man to make the hit. Second effort by Drake, though, will be close to the first down line. I think they will move the chains. Tremendous play by Drake. I mean, lowers his shoulder. Foster again shows up on defense, gets in there clean. Drake just makes a better athletic play and gets a first down. Now 
TJ Yeldon had a nice run, but for the most part, it's been Kenyon Drake that has probably had the best first half offensively for either club. Well, we talked about the running backs, Drake, Yeldon, Derrick Henry. And the coaches said that Tyron Jones and Al T. Tenpenny have also had good camps, but it's just uh, when you got the three in front of you like that, Drake, Henry, and Yeldon, it's going to be tough to get them some action. That pass almost picked off. You see the black jersey there of Tony Brown. Well, you want to talk about a guy that could be an impact player. He's wearing, he's in a non-contact black jersey. You see his left arm, left shoulders all taped up. He actually had a, an injury back in high school, and he's an unbelievable track star. I'm talking about world-class speed out of Beaumont, Texas. He was running track at Alabama, tripped over a hurdle, and fell on the shoulder and hurt it again. So they have kind of uh, put the reins on him a little bit, but when you start talking about this young man in the future, the eyes of these coaches light up, Joey. Absolutely. And, and corner is a, a position, again, where there's some question mark for Alabama coming into spring and into the summer. And so a guy like Brown, who can play and show that flash of athleticism, that, show, that, that flash of playmaking ability, that's an area where he'll have a chance to get on the field. Raheem Falkins on a nice catch. That'll be a first down at the 32. 20 on the play, so the clock approaching 60 seconds to go before halftime. Bateman lofts it up. Hawkins looked like he was running out of bounds. Incomplete anyway, coverage by Tony Brown. Just some numbers on Tony Brown while we're on him in terms of speed. He's been clocked now. It was win aided at 10 3 7 hundred, but his official best is 10 5 in the hundred. Ran a 7.76 60-meter, fastest time in the nation in 2013. And he uh, won a state championship in the 110 hurdles in high school in Texas. I know you're a speed guy. You, you got to like a guy like Tony Brown, huh? Yeah, it's unfortunate he's on the wrong side of the football. I like the speed <laughs> guys that, 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 are, that are playing receiver. But, you know, with, with that kind of makeup speed, especially at corner, it gives him the ability to sort of bait a quarterback in the throw on some of these balls. The deep ball, he knows that he's the fastest guy. He knows he can close. He knows he can go get the ball. This will make, you know, when you think about speed, cornerbacks, Daryl Green, uh, you think of Deion Sanders. Those guys knew that they could close on the football while it was in the air. And as, as, as when he develops, when he uh, you know learns the system, gets more comfortable, gets healthy, it'll be interesting to see if he can turn that speed into really good ball hawking ability because that's what those speed guys that were good at it they could go get the football. Third down and 10 coming up. Bateman, by the way, 7 of 14, 95 yards. He'll throw it again. Gets out of a little bit of trouble. And he will run out of bounds right at the first down line, at the original line of scrimmage. Jonathan Allen, who has been all over the field. That'll be a loss of, let's see, they'll say he stepped down back at the 36, a loss of about four on the play. Yeah, and that's a young man's mistake right there, Dave. You've got to get rid of that ball. You always, I, that has to drive Coach Kiffin, the quarterback coaches, the offensive coach, everyone nuts right there because in that situation, that's what the rule is made for. Simply flip the ball out of bounds. Don't give up that four yards. You're talking about a team that, number one, they've struggled to put points on the board here in the first half, but you also have field goal kicker issues. Those four yards in these situations, they mean a lot. You don't want to just give them away. Fourth and 14 now. A timeout taken by the white team on fourth down. Good to hear the voice of our referee, Tom Ritter, down on the field. Veteran SEC official. Well, ESPN News coverage of SEC baseball continues tomorrow when the Florida Gators host the Georgia Bulldogs at McKeithen Stadium, Florida, the number one RPI in the country. Taking on the much improved Georgia Bulldogs. Last night rained out. They will play two today. It will be coming up tomorrow at noon on ESPNU. It's also live on Watch ESPN. You know, one thing you can, you can count on about Nick Saban and this staff that he has here is they're going to go out and get the cream of the crop, the best of the best 
and they've done so again and I think one of the the things we have seen develop not just here but across the country is a lot of early enrollees young men are graduating early from high school trying to get a little head start on their college careers they had six true freshmen come in early and a couple of jc's how important is that joey to come in and get a little bit of a, an advanced start on your college career well I, I think we will watch it play out especially in a situation like cam robinson who is starting a left tackle right now and he's only been here for a couple months he's an early guy so we'll see the way it plays out uh, me, me personally, I don't like it that much. I think that these these high school guys need to finish out their senior years in in high school, enjoying high school life, and then make that jump in the fall. But we will see if these guys they'll get a chance to get in front of these coaches, and we'll find out how it works out. Pass interference coming up as Drake slipped out of that backfield. Averett, the redshirt freshman, will be whistled for the pass interference. Are they going to say? Pass interference, number 28 defense. That's a 15 yard penalty, automatic first down. They'll spot that. That'll move just outside the red zone at the 21, our first flag of the day. Not a whole lot there. A lot of times corners will sort of panic when that ball is in the air and sometimes put their hands on the receiver when they really don't need to. The coverage isn't that bad. Just have the ability, uh, have the confidence to just turn and play the ball. Good play in this drive coming up. To the end zone. It'll be incomplete right at the goal line. Looking for Robert Foster again. Nick Perry, senior safety. Along with Averett as well back there in the end zone. And this ball has to get up and down a little quicker than this. That's a play that this safety has a chance to make that play. Nick Perry, that's a ball I'm sure when he looks at it on film will say, I should have just went and intercepted that ball. But again, ball in the air. A lot of times defensive backs, they got their eye on the receiver instead of just realizing I'm in good position. Now I have time to turn and play the ball. And that would have been a big turnover. Set up a little screen to Drake. Stays on his feet for just a moment. And it looks like an injured Crimson Tide. A couple of them. Reuben Foster, who made the hit on Drake, slow to get up. Boy, Foster has really shown today defensively. Time you get that head in there first. Your initial thought is some sort of head injury. And we'll roll over Reuben Foster, the 6'1, 245 pound, soon to be sophomore, inside linebacker. And I think if you if you wanted to pick out a first half MVP, Reuben Foster has been all over the field today has been outstanding. Three tackles misses missed the one in the backfield that would have been on the fourth on the fourth down. But again he's just been everywhere so far. It's good to see him get up and walk it off. Well, both players up on their feet, but Foster certainly a little bit slower to move than Kenyon Drake. They will take him right back to the locker room. 24 seconds to go before halftime. Tenpenny in the backfield. A three receiver look from Alabama. Bateman is bumped in the backfield. They'll check that as a sack. And Nick Saban having a little chat with his quarterback, Jonathan Allen, again involved in the play defensively. A loss of seven. All right, let's go. Field goal, let's go. Field goal, let's go. Let's go. 
So the field goal unit back on the field. And you see Coach Saban walking off the field for the first time today. Maybe what you said about standing too close to the field goal kicker makes those guys nervous. Uh, Coach Saban is completely off the field at the moment. 47 yard attempt on the way from Adam Griffith who missed from 31 earlier near hash that kick is blocked right up the middle the push came right over the center spot and guess who again I've been saying his name a ton today Jonathan Allen the sophomore at Leesburg Virginia has been all over the place part of that front three or four depending on the formation Alabama's going to run Three pressures, four tackles, three behind the line, a sack, and now a block. Come on. That's a good half. Yeah, it's disappointing. There, there is no outside rush and, and spring rules of field goal kicking, so they're just going to push in the middle. So you would think that'd be an area that you would uh, be able to block, but did not get it done there. And the, the defensive side of the football on both teams has been pretty good here today. Blake Sims back on the field just nine seconds to go before halftime. And the Crimson team will take a timeout. A lot of timeouts here as guys trying to uh, find the right spot. Boy, Lane Kiffin, we saw him on the far side. It was interesting talking to him. Yesterday at Link, well, he seemed to be a in a very good place. I mean, he felt very comfortable. He was open, relaxed. Um, you know, it's it's his offense. He's not taking. He's not the man in charge of everything. He's in charge of an offense, and he can just do offense. And you could just see the the look on his face was almost of relief. And feels pretty good. I guess you'd feel pretty good too, Joe, if you had all the weapons he had at receiver and running back. Absolutely. You talk about the running backs. You got Yeldon, Drake, Jones, Henry, Ten Penny Foul. I mean, if you're if you're offensive coordinator, you're coming in. Usually, and he said this. Usually, when you take over an offense, uh, you're taking over offense that isn't very good. He stepped into a really good situation. When you talk about his running backs, you look at outside guys like Amari Cooper, big playability. So. He has some weapons um, in his first year that, that most guys just don't get. Got to figure out the quarterback position, obviously, and solidify a couple of spots on that O-line. But I'd like to think this Alabama offense can put up some serious points. That pass almost picked off. Reggie Ragland got his hand on that. And that'll do it for the first half of football. No points on the board. As the defense wins the first 30 minutes of the annual A Day game here in Tuscaloosa. Allison Williams trying to grab Coach Saban, and he makes his way to her now. Let's check in with Allison. Coach Saban saw you having a conversation with your offensive coordinator, Lane Kiffin. Both offenses have struggled at times in the first half. What was the uh, conversation about there? Well, there was no disappointment. You know, we just try to play certain things in the spring game where we're not playing the situation in the game. In the last four minutes, we're going to throw the ball and go no huddle. It's good for both sides. So he was still playing the situation in the game where we should have run the ball, but I just wanted to throw it. So it's no disappointment. I think that Really, what we're not doing offensively is not controlling the line of scrimmage very well. So we're getting too much pressure on the quarterback. The quarterback doesn't have a chance to operate. So you can't make any explosive plays if you can't control the line of scrimmage running pass. So I think that's what we need to do a better job of. So that's a challenge for the second half. The fact that it's still scoreless, is that more an indication of what the offense has been unable to do or the defense imposing their will? Well, I think when you're playing against yourself, obviously, you know, every every negative has a positive. So if the offense is struggling. That means the defense is probably playing pretty well. But we're very limited in what we're doing really on both sides of the ball. So the players really have to rely on execution in a game like this to be able to make plays. We made some good plays. We just haven't made them with enough consistency. Thanks, Coach Saban. Guys. All right, thank you very much, Allison. Scoreless here at halftime of the annual A Day game. Time for us to send it to Dari Noka and Charles Arbuckle back in the studio. Guys, it's all yours. Dave, thank you much. So, what Nick Saban is saying to you, Alabama. 
It is the SEC on ESPN. We are back inside Bryant Denny Stadium. Dave Neal, Joey Galloway, Allison Williams down on the sidelines after two quarters of football. Nobody able to put any points on the board. Certainly the team led by Cooper Bateman had their opportunities. They got inside the red zone, actually got down to the one and could not punch it in, actually went backwards. Lane Kiffin trying to figure out his weapons on offense. Nick Saban, who spends a lot of his time on the defensive side of the ball, has to be pleased with the way both groups, the Crimson and the White teams, play defensive. Two guys that jumped off at us in the first half, Reuben Foster and Jonathan Allen, two really, really talented interior players. Foster, the inside linebacker. Jonathan Allen on the front three or four for Alabama. So we are about set for third quarter football. Once again, we'll have a running clock. And it's basically touch football on kickoffs. Take a look at our first half statistics. And offensively, not a whole lot for the Crimson team. Led by Blake Sims, just 46 yards through the air. Blake would finish up. Four of 12, 46 yards. On the other side, Bateman eight of 16 for 93 yards. Um, Joey, your your take on that first half was it better defense, anemic offense? How would you assess it? Well, I think we've seen a couple areas that we knew Alabama would be good. They got a lot of confidence in their linebackers, a lot of confidence in their their front seven players, and those guys played well. On the other side of the ball, you've seen. You know, the running backs uh, make some plays. Yeldon has 62 yards. Uh, Drake has 37 yards. You, so you've seen the big playability in the areas that you knew Alabama were already pretty good. If you showed up today, you're watching the game or you're here in the stadium, the biggest question was a quarterback situation. You wanted to see how Sims and how Bateman were going to handle the team, uh, handle the moment. We haven't had a chance to see that the way I think that we wanted to, and, and part of it is because of the pressure. They've had a lot of pressure on, on these guys, but at the same time, there's been some plays to, to, to be made, and I haven't seen either guy step up and make many plays. So here in the second half, we'll see if that changes a little bit. But so far, we just haven't seen what we showed up here today to see, and that's play of the quarterbacks. Blake Kiffin sitting down alongside Blake Sims, talking to uh, his quarterback, of course, Lane Kiffin, offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach, former quarterback at Fresno State himself. And we talked a little bit about the addition of Lane Kiffin. And for those who don't know the story, obviously fired midway through the season at Southern Cal's head coach and came here during bowl practice on, under the invitation from Nick Saban to come and just kind of watch, just give him his thoughts after practice. Wasn't really involved in anything, had a little desk he set up. As Morris is touched, he'll be sacked. But say he was coming in for a day or two, ends up staying for like eight days. Uh, said he loved it. He, he really missed it, not being in the game when he got fired for the rest of the regular season and had really no intention of coming here. I mean, it was never even discussed. But then Coach Saban and Doug Nussmeyer decided to go their ways, and it was almost an obvious choice. Absolutely. And I, and I think if you're Coach Kiffin or any other um, offensive coordinator out there out of a job and all of a sudden coach Saban invites you in well, just take a look uh, You would jump at that opportunity and as the days roll by you said it started at two and then next thing you know it rolled to eight days and Coach Kiffin's like this is great. You know I get a chance to just sit back and watch What this program is doing watching some of these players and all of a sudden coach Saban like you said there's a job opening and then of course jump at that opportunity because of the pieces are already here the winning tradition is already here so you step into a great opportunity to find success and coach Kiffin he seems as excited as anyone to be here well, he is a lightning rod in the world of college football there's no doubt about that is that pass is incomplete but you know one of the things we talked about and he really hasn't been available to the media which is something unique for him he's always been talking to just about anybody that'll listen but coach Saban keeps his 
coordinators and coach assistant coaches under wraps they really speak in august sometime to the media but after that that's their only opportunity so nobody's really had a chance to to get with coach kippen we were fortunate enough to spend some time with him yesterday and i asked him about his tennessee experience and he says you know what i love tennessee i loved what we were doing we got some of the mojo back but my dream job came open and when that came open he had to take he felt inside he had to take it and he's sorry for everything that happened around yeah. it but it's a once in a lifetime opportunity is how he looked at it and and that part of it is hard to understand if you if you're a fan if you're a guy even in the media and you're just looking at the situation uh, that is hard to understand in this coaching world there are jobs that you would take no matter what you have going on in your life no matter how happy you are somewhere if particular jobs open up, you jump with those opportunities, and that's what happened for Coach Kippen. Although you know, he didn't spend much time at Tennessee, and he said he loved it at Tennessee, the right opportunity opened up, and how there's no way he could say no. He had to take that job. Unfortunately for him, it didn't work out the way he had hoped it would. Said he's moved his family. Said he's the only guy, first guy ever to move from Manhattan Beach, California, <laughs> to Tuscaloosa. But he said he is. Uh, family came into town this weekend they're out house hunting trying to find a place to live and it's the life of a coach now the question is is we just had a shot of coach Kiffin up there a minute ago his thoughts about quarterback position is TJ Yeldon with the carry of five yards and a guy in attendance who I'm sure he can't wait to see and I think a lot of people Jacob Coker, there he is, the Florida State uh, soon-to-be transfer. He is still enrolled at Florida State, wrapping up, has to graduate, and when he comes to Alabama, we'll have two years of eligibility left. That pass is intercepted. D.J. Petway stays on his feet, and our first points coming from a defensive lineman. The junior out of Pensacola, Florida, with a 29-yard pick six. A young man that spent two years on Alabama's roster, left to junior college for a year, and has made his way back to the capstone and has the interception for a touchdown. And D.J. Petway is a guy, and I watched him in practice, and the first time I watched this guy change directions and chase down the quarterback, Sims broke the pocket, took off running, and I watched Petway run him down to the sideline, and I immediately said, that guy... <laughs> Is, is going to be scary. You can see his athletic ability on that play. So the point after is up and it's good. So the white team out in front. Petway with the pick six. And it's 7-0 here in the third quarter. We've been talking about quarterbacks. And when we come back, we will talk with one that has a national championship under his belt. Former Tide signal caller Greg McElroy, now part of the SEC network, will join us on the other side. You are looking at former Tide quarterback Greg McElroy, some of his highlights of his Alabama career where he won not just an SEC championship, but a national championship as well as a junior. And he joins us now. And uh, that's Joey Galloway, by the way, on that side. Dave Neal here. And uh, uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, uh, sorry you're not putting the pads on anymore, but we're glad to have you part of the ESPN family on the SEC network. I'm sure it's a, a new part of your life, and I'm sure you got to be excited about it. Well, it's strange. I'll tell you the truth. I'm down there on the sideline just taking all kinds of grief from all my old friends, all my old coaches. I'm wearing a media credential. It's just it's <laughs> strange. Right. It's, it's strange. But, but wait, I've had you a get good time so wait till you get free food out of this. You get, oh, you know, you. any kind of tea you want. <laughs> it's great stuff. Uh, you know, talk to me, Greg, about uh, the transition from you spent almost, uh, you know, your entire childhood up to where you are now playing football. And, and it's no longer a part of your life uh, from a playing point of view. Has it been hard to kind of give it up a little bit and move into a new direction? 
Well, of course, obviously, my entire life was spent trying to put my best foot forward and have a great opportunity to play in the NFL. But also at the same time, I had to realize this opportunity to be a part of the SEC network with everything that ESPN's doing, with everything the SEC conference is doing, and all the resources going into this project. I couldn't be happier with the position that we're in, and I couldn't be happier with, with the route that my life has taken at this point. Greg, I tell you what, your body's going to feel a lot better on the weekends <laughs> now uh, doing this job. Greg, my biggest question when I got here is I was dying to see Tuscaloosa. I was dying to see Alabama. Try, dying to find out. Every time I look around, there's a four- or five-star guy coming in. Why Alabama? Why do you guys come here? What is it about this place that makes it special? Well, truthfully, I can only speak from my own experience, but the reason why I came to Alabama is because when you step foot on campus, it just, you felt a vibe. You could tell the passion. And when I came to my first game, which was an A-Day game in 2000, 2006, I came and I realized at the spring game how much passion, excitement, and enthusiasm there was. And I think the fact that the tradition and all those things just make this place really, really special. And I'm so grateful for having had my five years here. Well, let's talk about what we're seeing right now on the field. Obviously, quarterback position was a question mark coming in. Blake Sims, even from the words of Coach Saban, has overachieved in his highs, had an unbelievable 15 practices, and earned the number one job as we wrap up this spring practice. Uh, your take on the first half of where we are, not a whole lot of offense in this game. There really hasn't been, but I think the play calling has been extremely conservative. I know Coach Saban breaking in a new offensive coordinator in Lane Kiffin. I know that he's somewhat handcuffed in what he's trying to do offensively today, but I also think that there have been flashes for not only Blake Sims, but also Cooper Bateman. I've been real impressed with the way the freshman's played. I think he's got a nice ceiling, and I think uh, I think obviously the addition of Jacob Coker in the fall camp is really going to help this team, and I'm really interested to see how things unfold, and I think whoever it is is going to be the guy that needs to show Coach Saban that he can trust him, and uh, that's going to be the guy that's taking the, taking the reins. Coach Saban talked about getting back to the way we do things here at Alabama after last season. Now, it's only two losses, but it felt like it was a, a lot more, especially losing to Auburn the way the way it happened here. Um, you being a guy that has played here, uh, you knowing this situation, what does that mean when Coach says get back to being the Alabama that we were and preparing the way we did? Well, I can say this. I know when I was a part of the team in 2008 and we lost our last two games against against. Uh, against Florida in the SEC championship game and then losing to Utah in the Sugar Bowl and just having such a letdown, such a poor performance, similar to that that they had against, against the Oklahoma Sooners in January. I really think that, that this is a recipe for Coach Saban where he can teach and he can show those kids, he can look back and they can put on the film. He said, this is where you guys did not play up to the standard in which we try to establish around here. And these kids are going to come out here in, in August and, and September and they're going to show that they have a tremendous chip on their shoulder. This is exactly what Coach Saban wants, minus the losses, but exactly what he wants from a teaching perspective. And that's what he is more than anything else, a teacher. You know, talk to me about the, the SEC overall. Obviously, Alabama's rival Auburn just had one of those years a year ago. But playing in this uh, eight Saturdays out of the year in this league, in this competition, can you I mean, is there can you put any tangible thoughts on that? I mean, from somebody who, who doesn't get to do it, what's it like to suit up in the SEC for eight Saturdays? Well, I think that the SEC network, truthfully, is going to give us an opportunity as a nation to kind of look in and get behind the scenes of what makes this conference so special. But really, the great thing, you can see it all around. You see the kids dressed up in the, in the dresses, and you see people of all ages wearing jerseys. You see the band, the, the million-dollar band, the Crimsonettes, the tradition, the pageantry, all those things that make the SEC so special and what really make it very different than every other conference I've ever been around. And I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity. Uh, to have played in the SEC, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be a part of the network that's going to showcase all the ma all the things that make it great. Well, fumble there. We'll give it to the Crimson team as Drake puts it on the turf. So a good opportunity now for the Crimson team. And don't forget that coming up on August 28th, it is SEC Network Football as it begins with Tim Tebow and SEC Nation live from williams Bryce Stadium. And then it's the Gamecocks opening the season at home against Texas A&M to be followed by Temple and Vanderbilt from Nashville. You want to see all that action, you got to go to GetSECNetwork.com and tell your TV provider that you refuse to miss out on that action. So the fumble down inside the red zone sets up the Crimson team. Blake Sims back on the field. Ball sits just out the five-yard line. Here goes T.J. Yeldon off the right side. He's driving toward the goal line, so they'll spot it just about the one-yard line. Great question for you. As you make your transition into ESPN, 
you're no longer on every Saturday. You're no longer one of the Crimson Tide. <laughs> you have to start making decisions that are more of a, a national-based question. Who's the favorite coming into this season, in your opinion, in the SEC? Who's the favorite to win it? Well, I think the favorite coming in has to be the the Auburn Tigers, truthfully. I mean, with what they have returning and the consistency that they had at the quarterback position late down the stretch, granted they did win six games by eight points or less, but the amount of talent that they displayed and how close they came, 19 seconds away from winning a national championship, yep. there's something to be said for that. And until someone takes them down, they have got to be the favorite. But I think Alabama makes a strong push, and I really think the SEC will be decided on that Saturday in November known as the Iron Bowl. And I really think that's going to be the way it goes. Well, here's a look at the Crimson team just inside the two-yard line. A little power off the right side gets Yeldon in to the end zone. He's done that a time or two in his career. I tell you what, the SEC West is going to be brutal. LSU is going to be good. Auburn's good. Uh, over in the East, I think South Carolina's got to be a team that you look at that will play for the SEC championship. But I would hate to be a part of this West because Ole Miss is going to be good. Ole Mississippi Miss State got a great quarterback. Dak Prescott coming back. It's going to be a wide open West this year. Without question. And honestly, with the how with how things are going for for Texas A&M that team could develop into a really special team if they have some type of development from their quarterback position regardless of who steps forward they could be a they could be a, a question mark in the in the west as well well as far as Alabama goes what do you make of the weapons we've talked a little bit about Amari Cooper today but there's other receivers out there that can make some some plays for you where DeAndre White's not even playing in this uh, A-Day game because of an injury uh, I mean, it's been a while since Alabama's had this kind of offensive weapons. You've had running backs, but receivers are loaded. It's unbelievable. The amount of depth, honestly, and I really think our second best receiving threat behind behind Amari Cooper is probably the tight end. I mean, I, I really think he's really special, and I think he has an opportunity to really do some incredible things. And I think uh, I think if given the opportunity, I think he, O.J. Howard, that is, I think he really could develop into one of the bright young stars in the SEC, someone to definitely keep an eye on. Let's say you're playing quarterback, and, and all of a sudden your offensive line has some questions. You're bringing a freshman in Cam Robinson, who's starting to left tackle right now. As a quarterback, what can you do to help Cam Robinson make the adjustment? He's still a senior in high school, you know, mentally. He has to make this adjustment all of a sudden to play left tackle in the SEC. What can you do as a quarterback to help him out? Well, I think more than anything else, when you're a freshman coming in, it's mostly the how unsure you are about yourself because coming onto the field, and you understand, Joey, yeah. you're kind of thinking to yourself, can I do this? Can I, you know, I obviously have the athletic ability. I was highly recruited. But no matter what, you, until you go out there and do it, you're still going to have some question marks and just have a, you just have to remain confident. And as a quarterback, you just pump that guy full of confidence as often as you possibly can. Handle him with kid gloves. And I know Coach Lane Kiffin, I know he'll do a tremendous job of getting the ball out quick, trying to make him feel comfortable, trying to get an extra blocker on that side, whether it be a running back or a tight end, to try to simplify the game for him and have it slow down a little. Some big boys, another 325-pounder. Yeah, he, he should be going to his getting ready for a senior prom right now, and he's playing in the A-Day game. It's crazy. Well, Greg, certainly uh, thanks for stopping by, talking with us. We will see you a lot in the coming months, as every Friday and Saturday you'll be breaking down SEC college football on the SEC network. And uh, good luck with the new endeavor, and I'm sure we will cross paths quite a bit in the uh, coming months. So uh, welcome aboard. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Greg. Nick Saban had a good one, and Greg McElroy, who actually came here under the regime of Mike Shula, had to wait his turn to get the starting quarterback job, and when he did, led him to a national championship. Wow, we got a second. Let's go downstairs, visit with Allison Williams one more time. Well, guys, at the end of the first half, we saw Reuben Foster shaken up and leave the field. He is still in the locker room. He's dealing with a stinger. It's affected him a few times during the spring. He missed a couple practices because of it. Stinger issue, nothing too serious, but he's not going to return to the game. Pass is caught, knocked out of bounds. Let's see where they spot it around the 40-yard line. Our Darius Stewart, the redshirt freshman out of Fultondale, Alabama, with a 27-yard pickup. Nice concentration here. Ball gets away. See the corner go, go in between the receiver and the ball, and he just keeps his eye on it and makes a big play. To Tony Brown's defense, he's got that bad shoulder and trying to avoid contact as much as you can. In that black jersey, it may have helped Stewart come up with that reception and off left side. Right at the line of scrimmage by Tim Williams. 
Tim Williams has five tackles. All behind the line of scrimmage has a pressure and a fumble recovery today. And another defensive player that we're talking about that's shown pretty well today. Yeah, we talked about, you know, getting turnovers on defense is something that uh, Kirby Smart, when we sat down and talked to him, was their number one goal defensively. Well, number two, actually. It, it was play fast and then create turnovers. And fumbles were the turnovers that they wanted to create more of. Haven't done a nice job of that. Got one here today. But that is something that they've been focused on trying to work on in the spring. They only created 19 turnovers last year. Eight fumbles, 11 interceptions. They were plus two in the turnover margin department, which was uh, fifth in the conference. But it was interesting to, to listen to Kirby Smart talk about fumbles in particular. He says, intercept, I want, any, I want any kind of turnover I can get. But we have got to get better at stripping the football from the opponent. I mean, and I don't was know, adamant about it. And I don't know that I've heard a, a defensive coordinator so focused on creating just fumbles. Yeah. You know, most guys just say, we got to get the ball back. And he, and he did say he'd be happy to get it back anyway. But with that much focus on just creating fumbles, I don't know that I've heard a defensive coordinator come into a spring, uh, come into an offseason with that much focus on just one aspect of the turnovers. You mentioned another aspect of this defense, and, and the, the question to Kirby was in our meetings, uh, give me a couple of areas since the regular season ended that you felt you needed to make some strides in. And the first thing out of his mouth is what you mentioned, speed. The speed game, especially the last two weeks, Auburn and Oklahoma ran a ton of plays against him, and they had a hard time adapting to that. They went around, visited other schools, had coaches come in, try to analyze how they could be better in that game. And uh, I'm sure, you know, that's the way college football's going now. And I think Alabama's trying to figure out how to match the speed on offense. Absolutely. And, and there's two ways you can go. And, and he mentioned this. You can get your, your smaller, faster team on the field because they can hold up to 12, 13 plays if they have to. Or you get your stronger guys out there realizing that at some point in time, you may have to get those guys off the field to get them a break. And then that's the situation you get yourself into. You're trying to get guys off the field. These fast-paced offenses won't allow you to sub guys. So you got to figure out a way to get your best 11 on the field of trying to stop these high-powered offenses. And that is a, that's a situation you hear coaches say, look, we want to visit other staffs that, that run fast-paced offenses to try to find out how you stop these things defensively without being so vanilla on defense because they do a lot here defensively at Alabama and they don't want to take their ability to be uh, different at times away just to stop some teams. Under two minutes to go here in the third quarter. Tied at seven. From a player's perspective, spring game, what did it mean to you as a player? I mean, how did you approach it? When I was a younger player, it meant the world to me. When I got a little older, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> then uh, I would be one of the guys in the black jersey at this point, right. um, hoping to sort of, sort of survive spring, um, you know, sort of, sort of sit back and learn. Uh, have some opportunities to, to get some mental reps as opposed to getting the physical reps. You always get try to get the young guys involved more in the spring. But, you know, if, if you're a young guy that hasn't played much, this is your first opportunity in a season to impress your coaches, uh, to get into the huddle with your teammates. There is simply a tangling of the feet that is no foul. Third down. I don't know that I agree with that call, but... Um, yeah, I think that was uh, it's unfortunate when a receiver gets pass interfered with and it's not called. I hate to see that in football, <laughs> maybe the worst, yeah, I'm sure worst situation did. ever there. But I'm I, sure you, you do. Know, but uh, as, as far as spring ball goes, and you're a young guy, you only have 15 practices to impress your coaches, impress your teammates. So every opportunity you get to get in a huddle it is like a game rep. You've got to take it like it's a game rep and compete to your – to your highest ability because that's your chance to get on the field in the fall. Cover step by Tyron Jones. Takes it to the 24 and a half yard line. Give him three on the carry. Well, I was here a couple of years ago, Joey, and the quarterback battle was open. A.J. McCarron battling Phillips Sims and 
AJ really had a nice spring and but wasn't really the announced winner of the starting job until almost week two. He, he was the starting quarterback, but Coach Saban played the first, uh, he and Sims, uh, in that first game. They both got some reps and finally determined that it was going to be A.J.'s team, and the 41-yard field goal is up and good from Adam Griffith. But a flag is on the play. Phillip Sims, by the way, went on to transfer to Virginia, and A.J., Held down that starter's job for a while, so the first time in a few years there's a quarterback battle here at Alabama, and I don't think a whole lot has been settled today, that's for sure. No, and, and I mentioned earlier, if you came here today, if you tuned in today and you, you had the idea of, I want to see how these quarterbacks perform, um, it's been difficult. Little foul, roughing the kicker. Defense number two, that penalty is declined. The kick is good. So they into the third quarter. We will head back to Tuscaloosa after this. Thanks, Dory. So we're going to the going to ESPN three at the top of the hour. That's what Dory's telling us. That's nice of Vidari to uh, give us a spot to go. It is the SEC on ESPN. And don't forget that the most storied conference in college athletics will have a new home as ESPN brings you the SEC Network. It's launching August 14th as the SEC Network will feature over 1,000 exclusive live events, including 45 football games, 24-7 coverage of all 21 conference sports. Go to GetSECNetwork.com and tell your provider you refuse to miss out on all the SEC action. It all begins on August 14th with the first football game coming up on Thursday of August 28th. Texas A&M and South Carolina followed by Temple and Vanderbilt. And you see over a thousand live events in the first year covering all 21 SEC sponsored sports. 45 college football games airing exclusively on the network. Of course, Brent Musburger, Jesse Palmer will bring you what will be exceptional SEC football games on the network. One of three every Saturday. Sims over the middle and that pass is dropped by Cooper. Well, Allison Williams down the sidelines has been a busy woman all day catching up with some great Alabama players. She has another one alongside. Yes, here with Haha -Ha Clinton Dix and Haha -Ha, that's secondary. A lot of turnover this year, especially with your departure and Vinny Sanceres. Who needs to step up in that unit? Well, I think Atlanta Collins will do a great job for us. Uh, Geno Smith and uh, Jabril uh, Washington is coming along well. What about a guy like Eddie Jackson? So tough. He has such a good spring and then gets the ACL injury. What advice would you give to him? You know, just stay humble. Um, come back harder. Um, prepare harder for it and just have a great time doing it, and uh, he'll come back better. All right, you're preparing for the NFL draft coming up in a few weeks. What has this process been like you so been like for you so far? Well, it's been a tough process. It's all been fun, um, traveling around to different teams and just enjoying this. It's been a great process. What about your experience at Alabama and the success you've had here has helped prepare you for your next step going into the NFL? Well, it's just been humble, working hard, um, competing against the best of the best, and going all out. All right, impressions of the spring game, another packed house. Um, are you surprised by the performance of the two units, a low-scoring 7-7 game? Oh, I'm enjoying it. It's a great process. They're doing great on both offense and defense. As you can see, the score is very low, so they're doing a very good job. How would you say the uh, demeanor is on the sidelines? I see you talking to a lot of the, the guys on the white team. Um, I mean, I'm with the white team. You know, they're the ones that's out there on the field, so I'm going to communicate with them and uh, cheer them up and keep them pumped up. All right, good stuff. Thank you, Haha. Guys. Boy, he was a good one. It will be a good one at the next level. There's Landon Collins, the guy he was talking about who, you know, you talked to Kirby Smart. Haha -ha Clinton Dix, C.J. Mosley was kind of their defense. This year, Trey DePriest. And Landon Collins, it'll be their defense. Absolutely. When you lose leadership, that is huge. Sometimes that, that's, that's bigger than playmakers. You need guys to lead your team. Coach talked about getting back that focus, that attitude, that intensity. 
uh, that's what leaders bring to your team. They, they bring guys together and they help out in those areas. Let's go. So you talk about a guy like Landon Collins and, and Trey DePriest stepping in for C.J. Mosley, stepping in for Clinton Dix, uh, Vinny Sunseri. That's where they'll have to step up. They'll have young corners outside. Jackson misses all spring. That's valuable time. So there's going to be some young guys that those leaders are going to have to pull together, get in the huddle, get focused. You heard A.J. McCarron talk about it wasn't the seniors uh, that weren't focused. It's some of the young guys you got to work with, and that's up to your leaders to make sure that those young guys understand. So first down and 10 for the white team. Alec Morris in at quarterback, the sophomore out of Allen, Texas. Going up top, and pass is intercepted. Tony Brown with his first interception here at Alabama. Looking for Robert Foster, the wide receiver, and Brown played it well. Again, you can see Brown speed down the sideline, gets his hands on the receiver, receiver goes wide, and then Brown has the ability. Shoulder must be feeling pretty good. He, <laughs> he's had a, he, he's roughed the kicker, uh, diving across his face on a field goal, and then uh, makes a play there on the ball, uh, jams or, jams the receiver, and then turns and goes and makes a play on the ball. That That is uh, his first interception, his second pass breakup, so he's had a pretty nice day. Six feet, 190 pounds. A true freshman enrolled in January. Derrick Henry with the carry. Not much happening there. Loss of three on the play. Parker McLeod in at quarterback. Parker McLeod, the redshirt freshman out of Marietta, Georgia. This pass will be picked off at the 35-yard line by the white team as Xavier Dixon comes up with the interception, the senior out of Griffin, Georgia. So we've had a couple of interceptions, a couple of fumbles. Nice job, batted in the air and still able to catch on to it is Xavier Dixon. I think the first thing you think about uh, today, especially when you watch Alabama and then even in practice, the athleticism of their defensive line, their defensive uh, front seven, even linebackers. We seen Petway earlier make a one-handed interception and then run it into the end zone. Their, their athleticism up front on that defense is, is outstanding. I mean, guys that can change directions, we talked about the amount of pressure that these quarterbacks have been under today, and that's because their front line, their front line is is outstanding defensively, able to get at the quarterback, able to get their hands in the air, and not just bat balls down, but bat the ball and then make an interception is another level of athleticism for the defensive line. Sean Robinson's had a good spring. Brandon Ivory has really solidified his spot. Jonathan Allen, we've talked a lot about him today. Aaron Jones dancing around, makes a little something out of nothing. Ends up being a loss of three, but could have been a lot more than that. But back to that defensive line, I think two guys that have transferred in from the same community college in East Mississippi, Jaron Reed, DJ Petway, we've talked a little bit about those guys, but what was kind of, you know, it's, it's hard to quantify because Alabama's always been good up front, but by their standards, maybe missed a little something last year. But apparently talking to uh, Kirby Smart and Nick Saban, they feel like this could be a real strength, and, and the addition of Reed and Petway uh, on that front side as well will be huge. It gives them some depth. What kind of defense were they playing at that junior college? I mean, you, you think about those two guys right. who have made a transition to Alabama to play defense and have gotten here and impressed the coaches since they've been here. You can imagine how good they were in let's junior go, college. Let's but, let's let's again, go. you mentioned the depth. That was a position when you talk to these coaches, the defensive line, it, it was like they sat back and kicked their feet up on the table when they talked about this defensive line. Uh, the playmaking ability and the depth, that is one spot that there is no question Alabama will be strong at. 
Petway and Reed coming from East Mississippi Community College where they won a national title in junior college a year ago. will be downed inside the five at the three yard line. We'll step aside one last time. 9.30 to go here in the Alabama spring game. Hey, hey Blake, it's third down and five. You can run for a first down. Throw the ball. Throw the ball. What's the situation in the game? It's third down and five. We got a chance to score. Now, I just want to ask you a question. I'm not the doctor. Where was your head? Down. Okay. That, 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 that's what we got to fix. Boy, great advice from the coach right there that every football player can listen to. Keep that head up. That was Reuben Foster who lowered his head and got hit uh, awkwardly. A little stinger in his shoulder and neck area. Yeah, and, and Coach David mentioned something that I talked about a little earlier with Sims. I think a lot of times these guys will be viewed a, as a quarterback and you let your athleticism sort of uh, play the background because you want to prove that you can stand in the pocket and throw the ball as well as anyone else. And in this system, you know it'll be a two-back system, uh, multiple tight end system, and sometimes you have to stand in the pocket and deliver the ball. Here today, Sims has had a couple opportunities to take off and make a play with his feet where he could have moved the chains, and I feel like he's hesitant because he's listening to people say, we need to see if you can prove that you can stand in the pocket. Well, sometimes you just have to play football. And the key to being successful offensively is moving the chains. And you want your quarterback to find the best way to move the chains and give your offense more opportunities. And Sims is going to have to learn, look, there's a time to throw the ball. There's a time to stand in the pocket. But then there's also those times when you got to let your athletic ability take over and go make a football play. David Cornwell, the early enrollee, true freshman out of Norman, Oklahoma. You see his numbers ranked 57 on the ESPN 300. And the number four quarterback pocket passer. You mentioned Sims, you know, he, he actually in 2011 was the odd man out in the quarterback race. They moved him to running back for a year before putting him back under center. And that ball slips out of the hand of Cornwell it'll go down as an incomplete pass and give us an opportunity to visit with Allison again. Well guys Blake Sims leaves the game and whether it's him or Jacob Coker that ends up being the next quarterback here at Alabama AJ McCarron had a little bit of advice as I talked to him earlier. He said the most important thing for whoever gets the job is that they cannot pay attention to what's going on outside the program. He said you're going to hear all sorts of stuff from fans and from media. You just have to find a way to create your own bubble. He said listen to your coaches, take advice from them, get to know your teammates. And then he added, but don't make new friends. You'll stick with the people that have been by your side throughout the entire process. You never know people's intentions. He goes, it's really important when you become the quarterback at Alabama, you know who your friends are and keep those people close, block everybody else out. Well, that sounds easy, but I'm probably uh, assuming here that that is not an easy thing to do. I mean, the Alabama quarterback is a rock star, and not just in the state of Alabama, but around the country. You see Sims's numbers, 6 of 19, 64 yards, uh, one interception. Let me put you on the spot a little bit, Joey. Uh, what grade would you give Blake Sims this afternoon? Um, not very good, and, and I, I would also give a bad grade to the offensive line. They did not do a terrific job of, of protecting Sims today, but there were times when Sims had a chance to make plays with his arm and with his feet that he didn't make, and that's unfortunately how football goes. A lot of times you'll go through a game and not have a chance to catch your rhythm, but football is a, is a rhythm sport. From any position, you got to get into a rhythm uh, Sims never got into that rhythm today. You could tell there were some struggles. Things didn't work out early. You got to find a way as, as you get more experience, you get more playing time to fight your way out of those situations, turn them into positive days. He didn't do that here today. So I, I wouldn't give him a high grade, but there are some positives, but definitely some negatives. More pressure coming from that Alabama defense. Sean Dion Hamilton, one of the early enrollees out of Montgomery, Alabama, the six foot, 240 pound inside backer, putting some pressure on Cooper Bateman, who's getting a lot of snaps today. 
The redshirt freshman out of Murray, Utah. 10 out of 20, 124 yards. You know, really hadn't seen much explosion in the run game either today. There have been some glimpses. Really thought Derrick Henry might show well today. Over the middle, and that's just a bad oh, throw behind the tight end. Throw the ball. Let's Kurt go. Freitag. You heard Coach Saban. Set your feet. Yeah, that's that's one of those plays I just talked about with Sims. Uh, Bateman is sort of in that same situation. Uh, has never got things clicking. Hasn't really, doesn't seem like he's gotten into a rhythm. That's a ball that has to be complete. Two open receivers. And to be honest with you, it was hard to tell which one the ball was going to in that situation. But those are plays that have to be made. These guys, the longer they play, you know, it, it's only been one spring. It's only been 15 practices. They'll get better. But when you're in a quarterback competition, uh, you have another guy coming in, and Jacob Coker, uh, that, that again, people are saying will be the starter here. When you have these opportunities, you've got to make them count. Well, they don't have a whole lot of time to break somebody in as Alabama once again, and I love that Nick Saban does this every year. They open up with a, with a difficult opener at West Virginia uh, in the Georgia Dome on August 30th. Uh, then Florida Atlantic, Southern Miss, and then they get right into the meat of it. Florida, then they go on the road to Ole Miss, which you know those Rebels are going to be ready to play yeah. under Hugh Freeze. I mean, I think that is a team. I mean, if they play in any other conference, any other division, they might have a chance to make a run at it, but they are just facing uh, LSU and Alabama and Auburn. And yeah, l luckily for Alabama, they, they get a bye week after the Tennessee, after they see Ole Miss, Arkansas, Texas A&M, <laughs> Tennessee, then they get a bye. And then they head on over to LSU. So it is a tough schedule, and that's why when you have a quarterback situation, in the spring, every day counts. Every single play matters to these young quarterbacks. And then you think about it, you, gotta, you have a guy that isn't even here yet, that people are thinking is going to be your starter you heard he's talented. You recruited him out of high school, but since then he's only thrown, uh, what, 40-some passes, 40-some passes at a college oh. level. Um, boy, that is that is a tough situation to have going into summer. Yeah, Coker was 18 of 36 last year, uh, backing up Jameis Winston through 250 yards, played in seven games, and will have two years remaining when he gets here to Alabama. Young man will graduate in May from Florida State. Take that degree, an impressive degree. I got a degree from there, that's why I say that. It's impressive. <laughs> Sims throwing up top, incomplete. Let's go downstairs again and visit uh, with Allison with more on Jacob Coker. Got no chance. What is the play? Yeah, guys, I had a chance to chat with him earlier today when he was on the sidelines before the game, and he will get his degree May 2nd. He will be here May 5th. This spring has been absolutely packed for him between school and workouts. He's doing about 19 hours right now at Florida State, but he was excited to be here. Surprising he's able to with that schedule, and he said he just likes to take in the crazy atmosphere here inside the stadium. I asked him about the competition he's entering into this summer at Alabama. He said, you know what, I just want to go out there and be the best teammate possible. I also asked him about his time at Florida State and how the national championship victory will prepare him to have success here at Alabama. He said those four years at Florida State were huge for him. He said it's absolutely prepared me to play football at this level. That experience, the experience with the coaches he had there is going to serve him well. He hopes during his time at Alabama. Overall, though, guys, after talking to him, I will tell you he is very humble and he will most certainly fit in here at Alabama rocking that camo hat from not too far away. And I can tell he's just really excited to be back or to be a part of the Crimson Tide. Well, it was my first chance to see him um, in person. And the first thing that jumped out to me when I saw him from a distance is, is I wasn't sure that was him because he was so big. He is six foot five, 235 pounds. Yeah, and, and that's needed here. And, and that's one of the problems that Sims has. This offensive line is so big, they're 6'4 to 6'6, six, six, and you need to be taller at times to see over these guys. I, I've heard Coker uh, compared to Ben Roethlisberger, another bigger quarterback that 
um, has some elusiveness. He's hard to bring down, and he has the big arm. So we will see. You mentioned he threw 36 passes last season. Uh, no touchdowns, one interception. So the, the quarterback rating isn't all that high, but hey, they, they, they keep saying that he is an outstanding quarterback and they're very excited that he's coming here. Well, the white team with a three-point lead trying to stretch that out now as we have gone under four minutes to go here in the fourth quarter. Boy, 10 hey, hit. throw the ball! The moment it's two minutes. he got hit and I think we'll see Alabama throw the football on the next play. Yeah, I'm I think not there's sure no that. doubt about it. There will <laughs> be a pass. I will stake my career in, in television Man, on the fact the that, that, yeah, there's going to be a pass. quarterback under center, gut play. How about the ability of coach to clean up the language with the mic on? I, I would imagine. He's a pro. I, I would imagine that conversation if he did not have a mic. They put the ball in the air. Look what happens. That's why he's the coach. Yeah, that's why you throw passes. <laughs> that's exactly go. why you do it right there. Our Darius Stewart with the touchdown from 32 Stewart. yards out. The ball down the field. <laughs> so a nice catch from Stewart, the redshirt freshman. Out of Fultondale, Alabama. Cooper Bateman with that touchdown pass. Cooper now 11 of 22, 156, and a touchdown and no picks. And the point after from Adam Griffith is up and good. So now it's a 17-7 lead. The white team out in front and. And certainly, um, you know, it's not just about winning this game. And Allison, what are they playing for today? Yeah, there is a lot at stake, literally, because the winner today gets to eat steaks, while the loser has to settle for beans. So the winning team gets the steaks, the baked potato, the salad, all the fixings, and the losers, including the coaches, guys, gets to eat beans. So it's a lot of trash talking that goes on and they sit on their high horse. They eat like kings, a nice linen tablecloth while across the room you've got the bare tables and the beans. So a lot at stake literally. And Coach Saban, I will have you know he always eats with the winning team. Shocking that the coach would go eat the steak. Well actually he just, you know, he, he called for the pass play and uh, it resulted in a touchdown. So maybe he should eat the steak. 2.37 to go in this one. The kick is dropped at the five-yard line, and they'll just run through the motion. Hey, sir, supposed to make it all through. Still coaching late in the spring game. Cyrus Black back there getting an earful from his coach. You know, one of the other things at the end of the spring game, um, it, it, it wraps up a busy season, you know, not just because of the, the, the bowl game ended in January. They go, coaches go heavy into recruiting. Then they get prepared for spring practice. And this is kind of a chance at this. You know, there'll be a couple of days where they break down the tape and whatnot. But here's a chance, an opportunity for a few weeks for these coaches to kind of relax a little bit. And tonight after the spring game, Coach Saban, Brings over a lot of the Alabama staff, not just coaches, but people from around the university that are involved with the program that really uh, do a lot for Alabama athletics. He invites them all over to his house. I think it's over 100 people uh, to entertain them and say thank you. It'll be the first time that these guys have had a chance to take a deep breath, you know, step back away from football, take that deep breath, watch the film, see where you've got to go in the summer and the offseason. But yeah, when this game is over, this is this will be this will be a huge relief, not only the players but the coaches also. Christian Jones with that catch. That young man is explosive in so many areas. What a one of the best return men, punt or kick return in the country. SEC Special Teams Player of the Year last season. Get rid of the ball. Sims dumps it off, and Henry drops it. Blake, you can take off running now. Well, 
I really think uh, you hit on something. I think Blake Sims is trying to prove to a lot of people today, Joey, that he can be a pocket passer. Yep. We know he's a talented runner. They moved him to running back. He was so talented yeah. when he got here back in 2011. Um, and I think he's kind of handcuffed himself a little bit with not moving around. That's just an added bonus with a guy like him. And that's the second time that we've heard Coach Saban say to him, you can take off running the ball. Even he's starting to recognize he's, he's handicapping himself. That's the athletic ability right there. Make a play. That pass. He threw that to the wrong guy. But you can see the Go athletic offense, ability man. making a guy yeah, miss go. and Let's getting go. outside the pocket. You, you could see it there. He's got to be a more natural player, and then we'll see if he can play quarterback. But as long as he tries to be something he's not, it's going to be difficult. Reggie Ragland had that interception. Taking it away from Cam Sims, a true freshman, early enrollee. Second interception today for Blake Sims, who looks like he'll wrap up his afternoon with the numbers of 8 for 25, 76 yards, no TVs, and two picks. See how this offense, uh, when it means something, August 30th against West Virginia, um, the touch that Coach Kiffin will put on this offense, because you know there will be some unique wrinkles that he will bring to the table, and uh, and obviously the foundation will be pretty much what we have seen over the years under Coach Saban. But I'm sure there'll be some twists from formation looks that uh, teams haven't seen before. Well, of course, and, and I think the the first piece of that puzzle is figuring out who your quarterback is. And, and I think that once you find that out, that'll let you know what your wrinkles are. When you find out what your starting quarterback is good at, what his strengths are, whether that's Sims or Coker or Maven, once that guy is in place, then you can mold your offense around that guy, and that's where your wrinkles come in. What's he strong at? Can he roll out? Can he go opposite of his throwing arm and still throw the ball? Is he arm strength? Those kind of things will dictate to you offensively what those wrinkles could be. Think about this offense last year. I mean, it wasn't like they were awful. They scored 38 points a game. <laughs> they rushed for 205, threw for 248. That pass batted down the line of scrimmage. And you know, on the flip side of that, you talk go. about defense. What? They only gave up 13.9 points a game. That led the conference. 100 yards rushing led the conference. They gave up 180 yards passing. That was second in the conference. They were first in total defense, but yet it wasn't good enough because I think the way it ended, they gave up, gave up 45 points to Oklahoma in the Sugar Bowl. And I think you start looking at that fast-paced offense, and you're like, teams are going to try to attack us, much like Auburn and Oklahoma did. I think you have to. Because when you look at Alabama, and you look at their, their athletes and their size on defense, you're not going to just overpower these guys very often. So you have got to find different wrinkles, different ways to beat this team and make it, put them in a situation where either you wear down their big guys or you overpower their athletic guys or ways you do that with this fast-paced offense. Sims will get a few more reps with 114 on the clock. So, Joey, if you're an Alabama fan and you were here today or you're watching at home, it's T.J. Yeldon gets the screen and he's dropped at the 30. What's first your takeaway from the spring down, game? Go. I feel good about my defense. I feel good about my front seven, really good about my front seven. Those guys have shown some athleticism that you won't see many places. I feel really good about my running backs, which I did already coming in. I knew what those guys were. Um, there have been some drop footballs today by the wide receivers. 
which Time is out. also something Time I saw out. in practice. You know, Cooper is, is a playmaker outside. They, they've been raving about what he's done, the progress that, that he has made. But the biggest question, and everyone has it, even before today, was this quarterback battle. And that's the part that's incomplete for me. If I, if I, I showed up and I'm an Alabama fan, the part that's incomplete that I'm, I don't feel comfortable with is the quarterback battle um, and also then the offensive line. You, you knew you had questions. When there's a, a, a freshman starting at left tackle uh, on an offensive line that if you talk two years ago, there was question whether this is the best offensive line in the history uh, of college football. All of a sudden you have a, a freshman starting at left tackle and an early enrollee. That says you have questions. You have depth issues on your offensive line. So those two areas are kind of scary. Well, coaches, uh, if you've been watching, has been kind enough to uh, let us put a microphone on him. Let's listen in to some of his comments today. Come on, oh, let's put a drive together. Let's go. Come on. The slot guy is wide open. The guy didn't even come down and cover him. You throw that over route on first down, they, in Silver Dot, they play double sink every down. Well, what is the play? What was the play? What was the play? We're going two minutes. we got to throw the ball down the field. We're, we're going to go two minutes, and we're going to throw the ball down the field. But it's Mayday. I mean, like we're behind in the game, which we are. Got Mayday. Got to go for it on fourth down. Let's go. Compete. Boy, DJ Yeldon dancing around. Breaks the tackle, gets it out to the 45-yard line. Gain of 15 on the play. That'll stop the clock momentarily with 36 seconds to go in this one. And the white team will be eating steaks tonight. Beans and Franks for the Crimson team, it appears. Yeldon closing in on 100 yards, 11 carries, 95 yards. Good pass over the middle. It's caught by Chris Black, and he dances around, and he'll scoot into the end zone. Touchdown for the Crimson team, 55 yards. Good timing. There was good balance. You can see Sims get back in the pocket, cut that one loose. That you can see it when he feels confident and he, and he gets in a, in a roll right there and throws that ball. He has plenty of arm. He he has the arm to be a quarterback. Now he has to bring the entire package together. Point after is up and good. Actually, no good. Misses it. Griffith misses the point after. So. 17-13 with 21 seconds to go in this one. Chris Black, the sophomore out of Jacksonville, Florida, has eight catches last year, a couple of TG TDs. Remember, no DeAndre White today, another one of those receivers. When you look at Chris Black, DeAndre White, Amari Cooper, Christian Jones, it's going to be hard for some other guys to get in there. Guy they like, Cam Sims. We Saw him a little while ago, a true freshman out of Monroe, Louisiana, was considered the number eight wide receiver in the ESPN recruiting list, four-star prospects. I don't know that I remember an Alabama receiving core as deep and as talented as this group is. They've always had the one or two guys, you know, that could play, but they've got four, five, maybe six. I think the best, you could argue this, but I, I mean, I go back to Julio Jones and just what a beast he was every Saturday. Yeah, there's definitely some athleticism out wide. Athleticism in the backfield. Now you, you just got to get that other key part. You yeah. got to get that guy that's going to deliver the ball. And we talked about it a little bit today. There's been some drop balls on the ground. And part of that just comes, you got to get your athletes with your quarterbacks and, and just spend some time catching the football. And, and, and that hasn't been great here today. Red team's ball, let's go. Red team's ball. Let's go. Red team's ball, let's go. Offense is up. Offense is up, let's go. Coach Saban is determined that the red team, despite what our officiating crew may say, who has the football, Coach Saban says the red team has it. And I'm going to go with the coach. 19 seconds on the clock. Now, I don't know if that went to 10 yards or not. I don't know who came up with the football. It's hard to tell. 
But if the red team goes down and scores and wins this and they get the steak dinner, if I'm on the white team, I might have a little comment. Let's look, review the play. Yeah, you could be a little upset over that. <laughs> right. I mean, Coach Evans stepped in and, and said red team ball, and the officials actually pretended as if they were huddling, <laughs> yeah. as, as if they were going to make a decision. Over the middle, pass is caught by Cooper. Couple of good blocks. Cooper trying to get to the outside, turns the corner, steps out of bounds with nine seconds. So they'll have a shot to get it to the end zone. It's an 18 yard pickup. And again, Sims delivers a strike. Uh, he may have saved his, his best throws for this, this last couple minutes of the game, um, which again, Every every rep matters. Every play matters to these guys in the spring. And Sims has thrown uh, that's two consecutive really nice throws. Illegal motion hey, on hey, Cooper on the new side. Set. He wasn't set. You're supposed to know that. Huddle up. Let's go. So they should reset the clock. Not that it really matters to nine seconds. Maybe it does matter if you're on the Crimson team. You hear me, Blake? No, it's a 10 second runoff. The game would be over. Hey, the clock was stopped before. Sims throws underneath. Pass is caught by Black, and that'll do it. All right, let's go. You guys are over here. You so the spring game comes 20. to a close, and the white team will be eating steaks tonight. As a 2000. 14 edition of the A Day game is over. Lane Kiffin making his debut on the Alabama sidelines as the offensive coordinator. He will go back, assess the tape, figure out his quarterback position as we head toward August practice. So the final score the white team wins at 17 13. For my partner Joey Galloway and Allison Williams and our entire crew here in Tuscaloosa, I'm Dave Neal saying so long from the capstone. And we hope to see you folks down the road.